Hello and welcome to another edition of Out of the Blue. I'm Mike Browning. Few symbols of the wild American West are more representative than the sheer beauty of the wild Mustangs. These rugged horses still roam the West and right here in Middle Tennessee when they are brought to MTSU's Tennessee Miller Coliseum as part of the famous Extreme Mustang Makeover. For three months, the wild Mustangs, previously untouched by human hands, are trained to perform and compete. The finals were a thing of beauty. The power and beauty of an untamed horse. Thousands of Mustangs roam wild on the western rangelands. But with the right kind of training, some of the wild Mustangs gallop and follow the lead of a trained horseman. In a matter of three months, they are prepared to compete in the extreme Mustang makeover competition on the MTSU campus. Remember, a Mustang's a wild animal. They're not crazy, they're wild. So they're like any other wild animal. In a horse world, it's, they're a prey animal. So they, they fly, they got the flight instinct. Randy Spiegel and other horsemen are paired with their wild Mustangs through a random draw, three months before they are transformed into compulsory maneuvers and freestyle competition. The finals showcase the newly tamed Mustangs at MTSU's Tennessee Miller Coliseum, home of the highly respected horse science program. I've never seen the Phantom of the Opera done at one of these. It's a good song and it, uh, my horse was black so it kind of matched him and everything wasn't exactly like we normally would have it. Uh, and typically we'd lope some circles around and come down through and that, through that bounce of Cavaletti's and that ring of fire. And, uh, and we had a little trouble, he kind of looked at that yesterday, the first time it had ever been, had ever been set up in that arena and uh, different shadows and things like that. So we, uh, you know, he kind of looked at it and I had to kind of coach him on through that and get him through. Once he went through it the first time, I, I knew we were going to be fine. We started going through that and come back to the pedestal and then this horse rides really, really well through your legs. And so you can take the bridle off this horse and you can lope circles and guide him with your legs that's about anywhere you want to go. Especially when he's real attentive and he's, and he's really locked into you. So that, that was my next move was to take the bridle off and lope some circles with him, come down through there and come through the ring of fire and, and all that bounce with the bridle off. And, uh, and it paid off, it worked. I'm in the Spotted Saddle Horse Association. I do the Spotted Sport Horse. So I do a lot of obstacles. I do extreme cowboy races. So I spend a lot of time in the woods. So I, I implement a little of the sport horse, the trail obstacles, extreme cowboy stuff. Another little thing that we done last year and then we come back and done it again this year and added to it is we're jumping the horse on a moving flatbed trailer at 12 mile an hour. We got flags flying all over the truck and the trailer. We got a piece of PVC pipe around the back like a, a archway with flags on it. I always dedicate that to our troops. You know, I'm a veteran of the Army. Uh, our troops is, is sacrificed so much for their families and for their country. That's why we're here in America and get to do the things we get to do and get enjoy. So when I go and do my entertainment at horse shows or here last night, we dedicated to the veterans. You know, it's a heartwarming thing and uh, it's a lot of fun. Your horses, if they're trotting, they're going to jump hard. They got to get over it. If they're loping or cantering, they jump easier because they're in stride. Same thing on the trailer. They get in time with it and let your horse time himself up just like on the jump. He'll time himself up and he'll just float right up on that trailer. That's time. Thank you. The top 10 finalists emerged from more than 40 adult competitors. Now, following the competition, the horses were available for adoption. The Mustang Heritage Foundation and the Bureau of Land Management created the Extreme Makeover event. Well, MTSU continues to entertain a number of distinguished guests on campus, including a former FBI agent who can read you like a book. Author Joe Navarro delivered a lecture on the forensic on use of nonverbal communications as part of the nice, William Bass Legends in Forensic Science lectureship. And a veteran journalist who spent 30 years with the Tennessee Associated Press now works for the Center for Public Integrity, gave a lecture on how the organization works to keep the government and corporations honest. Sandy Johnson and the Center for Public Integrity track special interest money to identify who is manipulating whom. Here are two stupendous money numbers that you should know about Washington. $3.5 billion is spent on lobbying each year, 
and upwards of $8 billion will be spent on the 2012 campaign. That's $11 billion to influence Congress, the White House, and the federal agencies. Johnson's lecture is part of the Sigenthaler Speaker Series, sponsored by the Sigenthaler Chair of Excellence in First Amendment Studies in MTSU's College of Mass Communications. Many people continue to lament the blurred lines in the news media between what is news and what is commentary. The Juan Williams NPR controversy is just one example. Others complain that the discourse in American media has become well, less civil. John Sigenthaler and his son John Sigenthaler Jr. visited the MTSU campus this fall to discuss this issue with future journalists. It has moved, as you said earlier today, most often to coverage of celebrity. It's not just celebrity, but it's what I would call uh, uh, less light uh, and more heat. They've seen dramatic changes in journalism, not necessarily for the better. For well over a half a century, the Sigenthaler father and son team have lived and covered history. We're especially proud that uh, he's able to be with us today, and uh, I love him very much. Now 84, no doubt the newsroom of the elder Sigenthaler's early days has changed, as he put it, from all male and lily white. Uh, that has certainly changed and changed remarkably for the better. Secondly, the most uh, dramatic change of all, I think, uh, involves the technology uh, that exists today compared with the technology that existed in uh, 1949 when I walked into that newsroom. And I would say that I am disappointed and saddened by what I'm seeing. I think that what television news has become, especially on cable, is a series of food fights. The junior Sigenthaler told students that when he helped start MSNBC in 1986, most never dreamed journalism would evolve the way it did. But this is from a, a website called Mediaite, and it run by a friend of mine named Dan Abrams, and I just pulled these stories off, to, off his website uh, yesterday. They give you an idea. So here's the headline, uh, Andrew Breitbart to Tea Partiers. We outnumber liberals and we have the guns. Michael Moore tells college students, it will require a rumble to fix America. They called not so much for the protection of the First Amendment from censorship. After all, John Sigenthaler Sr. is the founder of the First Amendment Center. But to urge future journalists to fight against the dramatic legal shift in protected speech with a commitment to responsibility. Without a commitment to fact-based journalism, there is a danger that this, that this wonderful new technology will undermine uh, public confidence in the media even more. The present and the future of journalism, Sigenthaler says, is online. Both men worked in separate mediums of the past, print and television, which have now all but converged into one. Sigenthaler urged future journalists to hone multiple skills in the new media world. And it starts with writing, and it starts with knowing about history. I mean, yes, you can look up almost anything on Google, but if you beware, if you look it up on Wikipedia, it may not be right. I, I suspect some, some of your professors have told you that. The new world of journalism requires that the professional know how to edit video, take still pictures, and transmit the new technology. It didn't really turn out the way we expected, and I'm not sure we know what the future holds. That's what's so exciting for all of you. The John Sigenthaler Chair of Excellence in First Amendment Studies is in the MTSU College of Mass Communication. It supports a variety of free speech and free press issues. The younger Sigenthaler is a member of the College of Mass Communications Board of Professional Advisors. And ever since that moment, I've been in love with books. Books are very important things to me. Desde Middle Tennessee State University, le damos la bienvenida a nuestra serie sobre las oportunidades para una educación superior en Tennessee. Hola, me llamo Chrissy y fui estudiante en MTSU. Estudié el periodismo y español como asignaturas principales. 
Me gusta MTSU porque aprendí mucho y mis profesores fueron muy serviciales. Hay muchas clases para elegir ofrecidas en diferentes horarios. Por eso pude trabajar tiempo completo y asistir a la universidad a la misma vez. Fue mucho trabajo, pero valió la pena. Me gradué en mayo y mi educación mejorará mis oportunidades para obtener un trabajo mejor. Por mi educación, tengo más opciones de trabajo. Recomiendo que todos asistan a una universidad para lograr sus sueños. Financiado por Title I of the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act of 2006. At its heart, education surrounds us with everything we need to reach our dreams. It puts us in the middle of a host of opportunities. One university puts you in the middle of everything. Middle Tennessee State University, Tennessee's best. The rights and freedoms we all enjoy as Americans are so much a part of our heritage that we often take them for granted. As a reminder, MTSU celebrated Constitution Week by highlighting one of America's founding fathers. John Adams was the framer of the Constitution and is known as the father of American independence. In our cover story, we see how MTSU's own political science and history experts helped complement John Adams Unbound on display at MTSU's Walker Library. John Adams, founding father, America's second president, vice president under George Washington, was a man of books. His library was filled with thousands of scholarly works from philosopher John Locke to the Treatise on Man. It all started at age seven with a gift from his Puritan father. And ever since that moment, I've been in love with books. George Baker portrays John Adams, who first established his reputation in the courtroom as a lawyer in the Boston Massacre trial of 1770. Adams defended unpopular British soldiers who were charged with murder after some fired into an angry crowd killing five colonists. Six soldiers were acquitted, two convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter. And this is what I said exactly to the jury. I said, we do this because it is more important to the community that innocence be protected than it is that guilt should be punished. Photographic reproductions of Adams's life and personal library are on display at MTSU's Walker Library. John Adams Unbound is a traveling exhibit funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. The books reveal the intellectual and political ideas that shaped the thinking of one of America's founding fathers. John Adams read about all four, four corners of the globe. The ordinary voter probably hadn't been more than 20 miles from his home. Okay. John Adams studied, as you see in this panel over here, the, the full spectrum of human religions to discover universal moral truths. The ordinary voter read the Bible, and that was the end of it. During a panel discussion on Adams, MTSU historians and political scientists took up the legacy of the second president and constitutional lawyer. In an argument that would surprise many today, he argues that Machiavelli is far too optimistic about popular democracy and pays far too little attention to strong executive power. He credits Machiavelli with having seen the evils of human nature, but faults him for inadequate institutional restraints. Men were in the Senate, the best men, the natural aristocracy of the country, to check democratic foolishness. The problem is that Adams turns this very subtle appreciation of human nature into a fawning defense of the well-born, saying that we should idolize rather than scorn and restrain them. The rich, he says, are lambs, and that is his word, and the commoners are wolves, and in the process, Adams makes privilege into a form of victimhood. 
Critics like McDaniel say the elitism is in many ways Adams's great failing. Adams became America's first vice president in 1789 after losing to Washington. He was elected as the nation's second president, defeating Jefferson by a narrow margin. As president, Adams strengthened the central government, expanded the Navy and the Army, and imposed a new property tax that led to rebellion. But to quell the rebellion, Adams and the Federalists adopted the very unpopular Alien and Sedition Acts. Which today's otherwise fi fine traveling exhibit inexplicably chooses not to address. In his 1800 re-election bid, again against Jefferson, Adams was defeated in one of the nastiest campaigns in American politics. One of my critics in that campaign stated that John Adams was mentally deranged, <laughs> subject to uncontrollable emotional fits, I hate that, and at times absolutely mad, and this critic was Alexander Hamilton, you've, you've heard of him. John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, became the sixth president of the United States, the only son of a former president to hold the office until George W. Bush in 2001. After a long life and a 14-year correspondence with Thomas Jefferson, both John Adams and Jefferson died on the same day, July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And so, as he says late in his life in a letter to John Taylor of Caroline, quote, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself." Unquote. Despite their criticisms, few scholars deny Adams's keen observations of history. They just hope he is ever wrong about democracy's destructive tendencies. In addition to being the dean of MTSU's University Honors College, panelist Dr. John Vile is an expert on constitutional law. We'll be right back. Well, tell me why, baby, why, baby, why, baby, why you make me cry, baby, cry, baby. We started in 1911 with a clear mission to train Tennessee's best teachers. For the last 100 years, Middle Tennessee State University has carried out that mission and so much more. Nationally recognized as an affordable quality university, the number one choice of undergraduates in Tennessee. As we celebrate our centennial, we look with pride at the past. We look forward to the future. Check out why we're Tennessee's best. Education surrounds us with everything we need to reach our dreams. It puts us in the middle of a host of opportunities. One university puts you in the middle of everything. Middle Tennessee State University, Tennessee's best. MTSU's ongoing academic partnership with China continues to be evident in many ways. Delegates from four Chinese universities joined MTSU's centennial celebration. And more recently, an audience enjoyed The Song of Silk, a production at MTSU School of Music. This colorful performance of Farewell My Concubine is an excerpt from the Qin Dynasty in which the emperor loses control of the kingdom. The performance includes a masterful sword dance the production of the Confucius Institute of Chinese Opera at Binghamton University of New York presented the concert of songs, instruments, dance, and Beijing opera. MTSU's Confucius Institute and the School of Music 
hosting the evening. Have you heard of the Secret Sisters? Maybe not. Their name may well help define their meteoric rise to success, but their fresh country sound will keep the duo from being a secret for long. They've already caught the attention of the Americana Music Awards and recently performed with Paul Simon and at the Cannery Ballroom in Nashville. Well, tell me why, baby, why, baby, why, baby, why you make me cry, baby, cry, baby, cry, baby, cry. For a young lady who never flew on an airplane until she cut her first record in L.A., life has changed overnight for MTSU graduate Laura Rogers. We are the Secret Sisters and we are from Muscle Shoals, Alabama. She's toured around the world performing, about to release a second album with her real sister Lydia as an internationally recognized songwriter. Lord, I can't live without you, you know it's true, but there's no living with you, so what will I do? But not long ago, 2009 in fact, she was sitting in this small MTSU classroom taking a songwriting class with Professor Hal Newman. Uh, our guest today is Laura Rogers, <laughs> who uh, sat right over here uh, where you guys are. Uh, Since then, Laura Rogers has undergone a crash course in the entertainment business, producing music with the likes of Jack White and T-Bone Burnett. Come, come Tennessee, me, Tennessee. Her hit song, Tennessee Me, Rogers wrote in Newman's class. The Secret Sisters were recently nominated for an Americana Music Award as Best Emerging Artist. Rogers describes herself as a simple country girl who grew up in a musical family. When we were growing up, every Sunday morning, when we were getting ready for church, we prepared our minds for worship by listening to old George Jones records. No joke. I, I also grew up in a church that, that doesn't use any musical instruments, so my entire childhood was spent um, worshiping in a congregation where we had no guitar. We didn't even have an organ. I mean, we were very, it was complete a cappella. I don't know, oh, I don't know where I'll go. Rogers credits that background for their ability to blend with one another and the harmony they've become known for. She graduated in 2009 simply hoping to get into the business side of country music, but that all changed with one audition. Uh, I was working as a nanny and I loved that, but uh, a friend of mine told me that there was an open audition being held in Nashville at the Indigo Hotel and that there was um, a record label that was doing just a general talent search. And of course, m somebody like me who is terrified of that kind of situation goes in thinking, there, never in a million years would anybody be stupid enough to do anything with me. Uh, and my primary reason for going to that interview was to try to conquer my stage fright because I wanted to get to a point where I could at least sit on a porch and sing for somebody, you know. I just can't let you walk away. So I went in and I performed one verse and one chorus of one of my favorite songs. Guess I could find somebody to. Not only did they like her, they called her back for another edition. I told him, I said, I really appreciate your enthusiasm, but I have a younger sister, and if anybody deserves this, she does, and you have to hear her. Am I that easy to forget? Her sister drove in from Alabama and performed on her own, but the judges wanted to hear the two together. We had not rehearsed anything, it had probably been three or four years since we had actually sung a song together, and so we pulled out the guitar again and, and sang a song unrehearsed completely. And you could just see the little light bulbs going off across the table. If I'm that, easy to forget. that Rogers would take time out to offer her advice to MTSU students is a testament to her simple roots and to the impact that the MTSU songwriting program had on her young career. Given stream within its waves of mercy, sweet forgiveness ever 
The Secret Sisters are currently touring in the U.S. and plan to release a second album with more originals next spring. That's it for this edition of Out of the Blue. Until next time, go blue! Join us in celebrating 100 years of MTSU history. Check out the Centennial Timeline at mtsu.edu slash centennial.